Hello everyone. Uh, thanks for coming out for lunch. I hope you're not very sleepy and uh, try to wake up. So um, I'm going to be talking about software build materials and SPDX. Who here has never heard about software build materials? You will know software build materials. That will be a very quick talk. Right. <laughs> so I'll be skimming through a little stuff about uh, general things about these bombs, and then I will be spending most of the time discussing these videos. Right. Um, that's me. As you can tell from my name, if you, if you do not know me, I'm Greek, I live in Munich. Uh, my day job, I work uh, for a large American company that you've probably heard of, it's Intel. Uh, my official title is my, the Chief Open Source Compliance Officer. And I'm working at the OSPO, right, the Open Source Program Office. And, um, and I've been doing open source in quotes since way before many of you were born. Um, we didn't call it open source back then, we didn't even call it free software, free software Yeah, uh -huh. they came right afterwards. I remember getting you know, the announcement from uh, Stallman that I'm trying to be the new thing. <laughs> so, um, and I've also been involved in S bombs and SPDX since essentially its beginning in 2011. So, I'm sure it's not news for you, and I don't have to tell you that uh, you know software is complex. We nowadays we build software by combining lots of things, uh, different components, libraries, whatever you want to call it. We used to say this is the 80-20 rule, right? So when you're doing software, 80% will not be what you're actually writing. You should be doing 20%. Nowadays, it's even way more. I mean, we're talking about 90 or something. Right? So if you're doing more than, if you're writing code for more than 10% of your product, of your software, you're doing something wrong. You should be focusing on exactly something, on what gives you the competitive advantage and use other components for uh, uh, doing the rest. Right. And, uh, yeah, open source, you know. <laughs> uh, helps lots of them on that one. So, the S-BOM, the software build material, uh, it's a record, like, like a table of contents, uh, which describes these components that are inside your software, and the supply chain relationship, where did you get it from, and stuff uh, for your software. Right. And when I say components, this includes both, uh, you know, modules, libraries, whatever you want to call it, uh, depending on your ecosystem and what you're doing. Right. Um, it's not only about open source, right? Whatever you're using, it's a component inside your software. So it includes both uh, open source and proprietary licensed components. Right, uh, and you can have them free, or you have maybe you have paid for them, and it doesn't matter. Right, and so you're creating this table uh, of contents for your software, the S bomb, and uh, and uh, this data you can publish it, or you can keep it for yourself, or you can only give it to your customers or only to specific customers. There is no general rules about that. We're just talking about <coughs> this record of uh, the software components inside the software. Right. So, the idea is that anyone should be using this so that you know what you have inside your software, right? So you support. If you're producing software, you can more easily support your uh, customers or the people who receive your software. Right, uh, and uh, on the other side, if you are a, if you are a user of software, you should know what you're getting, and therefore you can uh, more easily understand what you're getting and maybe you know mitigate risks that uh, appear. Uh, oh, and in this talk, I will not be using the word the uh, letter X Z for yeah. We spent enough time in the last weeks. Uh, it's just an example, right? Um, so, 
the way that you're using the bill of material, it might be regulated in some way because, for example, you have a contractual obligation, right? I am uh, licensing software from you, therefore I want you to tell me what you're giving me, right? I don't want to get the black box, right? Or I am providing software to you uh, and I'm going to tell you exactly what's in there, right? Um, uh, Open source licenses obviously then, uh, uh, are a very big part of it, right? So in order to be uh, legally compliant for each, for example, components that I'm using under an open source license, I have to uh, comply with the license, and the license might be uh, I have to copy the attribution, or I have to copy the license text, or I have to make the source available, depending on what the license is. And uh, obviously there's a technical side to that, because when, for example, when I'm getting software, I want to know if there is a specific library there, so that I know that I'm vulnerable to um, security, for example, uh, attacks, because a bad version of a well-known library is in there for the software. Right. So, um, All the ideas about that is when we started working on SBOMS, I mean, uh, on SPDX, uh, um, 11 years ago or more now, 12, uh, um, our main goal was uh, to uh, help people uh, with their legally compliant, to be legally compliant, right? So, since, as I mentioned, every component has, has its own license obligations and uh, you have to comply with them. Uh, you essentially have to know what's in there so that you know that you comply with everything. Right? It's not rocket science, it's not uh, uh, you know, very complex, but on the other hand it's not exactly trivial. Right? So you have to list everything and make sure that everything is okay. And once you know what's inside your software, right, the bill of materials that were uh, mentioned before, right, uh, then maybe you can use it for other things like uh, export control or the security part and stuff like that. So that was how we were working for many years until a few years ago security became a larger thing, right, and lots of organizations and um, yeah, uh, three-letter acronym and uh, yeah, uh, agencies get involved in that or many others. Right, uh, doing security, uh, obviously software supply chain security became a very hot topic. Right, and, uh, but again, the need is to know exactly what's inside your software. So the typical we had is, you know, do you know whether the software is, is affected by a vulnerability or something? And I just collected the ones that have nice cool logos and, yeah, in the last few years, right? Uh, there are many more <laughs> than that. And because supply, the software supply chain now is so convoluted and uh, complex, right? And you have, you know, I, I mean, I used to show this. This is the solar winds attack, right? How uh, uh, the attacker managed to do that. So maybe the in the last couple of weeks, the the example why technically is much much easier and simpler than this one. Uh, the social engineering part was also very, um, yeah, intricate and you know, long term play. And you've all seen the uh, XKCD that uh, yeah, inside your software there is a component that no one knows about. Um, some poor guy is maintaining or not maintaining and you're using it. Right. So in the last few years, couple of years, we have regulation which is not, on, not coming anymore, it's already here. Right. In the U.S., we had the executive order, uh, executive order by President Biden's White House uh, that on improving uh, national uh, cybersecurity. That was two years ago, three years ago now. But, uh, 
and Cosmos. And then they published their implementation plan uh, last year, right? Uh, uh, EU last December, uh, as you know, voted for CRA, right? Uh, and then we have uh, sorry, governments that have already passed uh, legislation or guidelines, depending on their uh, views. Uh, you know, German has published, Japan has already published, there are others who are having the queue. Uh, and the whole idea is all these regulations mentioned in bonds, right? Um, as in, you have to know what you're getting. Maybe there are restrictions, you know, only government should know what. They do not say that every consumer that buys everything has to know what they're getting, but you know, uh, it might uh, evolve into that later. But definitely there are regulations now uh, for s right? So this bill of materials is just, you know, I have to write, as I said, the table of contents of things that are inside my software, right? So I can say, if we look at Different codes there. Um, uh, inside the software, I have Zlib, uh, and it's under this license, and I'm using this version, and I got it from this origin, right? And I also used uh, GCC, and uh, this is under GPMP3 license, or data. And uh, use that version, and I got it from there, and maybe I can add more comments, you know, you know I have not modified it, all this stuff. And uh, the NTIA published two years ago, almost now, uh, the, min the minimum viable as well, right? So out of all this information that you, you may collect, right, uh, the minimum is tell me, you know, where did you get it from, uh, what's the component, what's uh, the version, give me unique identifiers so I can correlate it to something else. Uh, yeah, and who actually uh, created this as well table. Right. Uh, these are the main uh, things that have to be inside your uh, as well. Right. So the big problem is, the big problem is that no one has specified exactly how to deliver this information, right? Uh, we're just talking abstract until now. Yeah, I have to know exactly what's inside my software. Right. So, uh, since we've been doing that, I mean, uh, some um, parts of the whole software supply chain uh, were doing this thing way before this regulation came into effect. Right. Uh, they were using different formats for actually transmitting this information. So we had, you know, uh, Word documents, Microsoft Word documents that said, okay, this is inside, the, uh, and they had a table, right? Or they gave spreadsheets with the columns of, you know, this is a name, this is a version, and this is a license, and all this stuff. Or they had text files, that everything was dumped in there, right? Um, having seen this need that we want to have a standardized way to express this information, that was the origin of the SPDX project, as I said, a dozen years ago, right? Uh, we initially was calling, we were calling this as a software package that exchange, and nowadays we've shifted to system package that exchange, and I'll be talking uh, later about uh, the difference between software and system, because uh, it really affects something. Uh, parts of the industry. So the idea for this one is just to have a, uh, a formalized way of expressing this information. Right. Uh, a version of this was published as an ISO standard two years ago, um, 5962. It's freely available. You can download it from ISO. You can download it from our website and SPDX. Yeah, it's, you can get that. So the whole idea is it's a standard to represent information, right? There is nothing, um, or you know, the main goal of creating the standard is to be able to express information, right? We do not make value judgments. We do not say, ah, this should not be in there because 
uh, you know, uh, this is not good information. <coughs> if it's information that people really uh, need in order to transmit it to somebody else, right, we'll find a way to include it inside this project. Um, actually, the SPDX project, uh, it's a lot of projects uh, under the umbrella of the Linux Foundation. Uh, and we're working on three different things. We're working on specification, the actual specification of SPDX, how the format should look like. But this is just the format for expressing information. Uh, one other major uh, area of work is the license list. Uh, and I'll be talking about that. I hope you've heard of the SPDX license before. Right. And then we're also creating a few tools. And uh, I'll be talking for each one of them uh, later, right? And the way that we have organized ourselves is we have different working groups, one more technical, one definitely legal, uh, who are discussing all the licensing parts and the legal, because remember, that's our, uh, that was our uh, initial uh, goal. And uh, we also have the outreach team who tries to explain and convince people to <laughs> that this PDX is a great thing and we should be using it for this purpose. Stuff like that. Right. So let's start from the easy one. The license, the uh, legal working group creates the license list. The license list is just a list uh, of common open source licenses, or not so common, but. <laughs> Uh, we now have uh, 685 licenses and exceptions, and last count, no. yeah, okay, we should be around there. Uh, and for each of these licenses, we keep some information, right? The name, we give everyone the short identifier, and I'll be talking about that you know, on the next slide, right? We have the canonical license text, uh, reference URL, some metadata about. Uh, has it been approved by OSI? Has it been commented or approved by FSF? Um, all this stuff. Uh, if it needs a standard header text. Um, and then the last of this also includes guidelines for matching text, right? Uh, unfortunately, for us computer science uh, people who you know would love to have an exact matching text. This is not always the case, right? So even, I mean, think of even a very simple uh, license like uh, MIT or BSD, right? BSD has three clauses, and the clauses may have the numbers one to three, may have one parenthesis, may have one uh, uh, dot and the text, or may not have the numbers and they have asterisks or hyphens, maybe in, unnumbered list and all this stuff. Uh, but it's always the same license, right? So we went through it, every, one, every one of these 600, well, yeah, 700 uh, plus text, and we create a template of it so that you can match it. And we have uh, some guidelines on how exactly the match should happen. Right. So, um, the identifier, it's a very short name that we give to each license because remember, if we're talking 12 years ago, nobody was, we were all agreeing that this is the Apache license or Apache version 2 license, right? But remember, in all these Word or spreadsheets or text files that you were given, somebody was saying Apache space version space 2. Apache version 2, or Apache 2.0, or Apache V2, you know, and again, as computer people, we want to have a very specific one that we can match very easily, right? So we created, you know, for each of these licenses, we create a short identifier that should be used in place of the license, right? So we came up with things like MIT, BSD3 goals, because until now we were looking at 3 goals BSD, or BSD with 3 goals. Uh, GPL 2.0 or later, and all this stuff. And then, because our li life is not so simple that everything is just a single license, there are softwares that are being licensed under a combination of licenses, so we support expressions, and uh, so you can say that this is licensed under 
uh, GPL2 only or uh, ESD3 clause. This is uh, found, uh, found in the kernel, in the Linux kernel in lots of places, right? Or you can have an uh, EPL or MPL, and this uh, you know, expression says that yeah, you can use the software under the Eclipse public license or the Mozilla public license, the second version of each one. Right. And then we specified that for, especially in your source files, you can just put a single line comment that says this PDX license identifier Apache 22, right? And it's easy to use, it's machine readable and processable. Uh, yeah, um, it helps everyone. Uh, yeah, uh, list of projects, that's a very old list, but I mean, yeah, we managed to do <laughs> years ago the kernel and you put the Zephyr, and now more and more people are uh, using this. I don't want to spend time about this, it's pretty old information by now. Now, this is the license part. Once you get all the information about all your components, you create a document, right? And so, the, the characteristics of the document is that it's, again, the script, right? It only describes what about the software, right? Uh, and it's flexible because we do not specify a CD format, but you can use different formats to express the same information, right? Some of them are more oriented towards machine processing, others for human readability, we have lots of them, right? And uh, again, the focus is on capturing just the facts, right? And somebody else might do interpretation afterwards, right? So the, the document itself does not uh, say anything. It might say, I have this component under this license and this one, that component under the other license, right? But we aren't saying anything more. And people can read the information and then interpret that say, hey, this is not allowed, you cannot have these two components and stuff like that. But again, the fact is, we're just stating the facts, interpretation from outside. Uh, as a very old uh, example, in order to understand what we're talking about, this is a, uh, a minimal CD exertion 2 document, right? Um, that starts by saying, you know, uh, who created the document and when uh, and which tools were used, and then for a specific file, it has you know things like you know the file name and uh, uh, the type and a checksum to understand that it's exactly uh, this version of the file and which license was found inside the file, and uh, well, there is another license found in the file and uh, this is the copyright text found in the file, and I have a comment, and all this stuff. So basically, again, you record all this information. And if you record all this information about all your components, right, uh, you can create a, a comprehensive table for all your software. Right. And once you have this data, then you, you know, we have this uh, model that represents this information, and then you can actually uh, output it serialize it, as we say, you know, in different formats, right? You can uh, use uh, <coughs> the text value that you saw before, that we call it uh, type value, you can use JSON, you can use YAML, RDF, and whatever format uh, you prefer, right? This is the basics about SPDX uh, as a project, right? And so coming to the latest development on this one, um, there is a conference running right now, this week, in North America. The Linux Foundation runs the Open Source Summit. And uh, it's going to be announced there, but since I'm talking here, let's announce it here. Right. So yesterday we released the PDX 3.0. Right. This was uh, frozen during the weekend, and everything was published <laughs> yesterday. Um, so 3.0 is a major uh, re, re implementation of SPDs, right? Uh, it took us a long time, much longer than we would like to. Uh, the whole idea is that we abstracted the information a lot and we made it much more modular, right? Remember when we started again many, many years ago, the, the initial focus was license, 
right? Then, as you saw, uh, you know, uh, security became a much more important thing, right? And then we have lots of other stuff getting uh, there. And if we had the uh, monolithic approach in SPDX version two, this is a document with everything. Uh, that was not very user friendly, right, or process friendly, because we had many cases where we were uh, saying that uh, the user wants to focus on the security information and does not care about licensing at all, right? So it should be much easier to separate the, dif uh, the different parts uh, of information inside the document. Right? So uh, yeah, we have started a lot of it. And we factor the whole thing to different profiles. Right? So we have the core, which just talks about uh, uh, general things about you know what is a file, right? not even a file, what is an entity, <laughs> and the relationships between them, right? And then we have profiles that are specifically towards an area of interest. Right, so we have one about licensing, obviously, right, but we have one for security, and uh, we have one for provenance, and we have lots of others in the uh, well, right. Uh, this also helped us to move a little faster, right, because otherwise we were the same people trying to discuss everything, and it took a while. Right. Uh, I'm, I'm saying that when I'm describing SPDX, is that it's complex, but it's not complicated. And it's complex because the underlying problem is complex, right? You have to express all, you have to be able to express all this information, right? You might care about only licensing, and you say, okay, that's easy, I can put the licensing. But others might care about security, and others might care about lots of other things. So, SPDX 3.0, uh, gives you an underlying structure that, uh, and a framework that you can use in order to record whatever information you want about the SP. Um, so, instead of the monolithic approach that we had in SPDX2, SPDX3 is graph based data, right? So, we have different objects, if you want to call them, yeah. In abstract objects, which might be a file, a package, a, a vulnerability, a license, things like that, and then we have relationships between them. So everything is you know, <laughs> very graph uh, uh, oriented, uh, and that really helps also the supply chain approach, right? Because uh, remember when we were talking about SPD version two, that what you were. Uh, producing something for your software, but if your software became a component in somebody else's software, because you know the whole supply chain, I'm taking something for you, and I'm taking something for you, and I want to combine them, right? You would have to merge all these documents together. And we saw a limit to what was feasible by then. Right. So right now everything is graph based, so you can easily you know join graphs and just add more things to the same graph. So, this is an overview of the profiles that we have published um, yesterday. And starting from the bottom, this is a core, which has only the notions of what is an object, for example. <coughs> and then we're talking about software, which introduces things like what is a file, what is a package, what is a snippet inside a file, right? And then we have the profile about licensing, which obviously can express everything that we were able to express until now, what's the license of this thing, right? Which might be anything of the uh, other things that are being defined as well, right? And uh, what are copyrights and all this stuff. Um, and then we also have a special profile to get light, which is a minimal subset in order to be able to um, transmit the minimal amount of information in a very simplified way. Um, going on from the top, we have security. Uh, that's obviously you know all the security information about vulnerabilities and all the stuff. Uh, once you go deep inside that path, you will be you know, amazed at the complexity of the things that 
and you want to be able to express, right? That things like this is on the SSL version 3.1, and I know there is this vulnerability, but this is not present in here because the path, uh, uh, you know, the variable path of function calls cannot be called in my case, and all this stuff, right? So, in order to be able to express all this stuff, we need a complex language for all this stuff, and yeah, we managed to be able to represent all this stuff. As we get build information is, you know, uh, yeah, I have this binary and I create it using these tools and under this environment and all this stuff. Right? And then we added AI and data, right? Because um, I'm sure you've heard there is an AI thing happening. Yeah. So, yeah, in order to express, okay, this is a software, but this has a model which was trained on this data set. And this data set is under that license, and I've trained it, and uh, then I have this model, and the model has this license, if we're talking about license, right? And then we can also have all the builds and the security applied to all this stuff, right? So, yeah, uh, there's a lot of information that can be uh, represented in this. These are the profiles that are being actively working, worked on right now, but they didn't make the cuts yesterday, so they will be published in the next version, 2.1 probably. And how do you express software as a service, right? Not software that you're actually transmitting, but you're uh, communicating with the software as a service, right? The operations, operations profile is something new that actually started early, in the beginning of the year, or late last year, and they're talking about, you know, uh, what about the, the primary focus is about export. Right. How do you present export information, export control, which is much, much more uh, you know, varied and diverse than some people in the US think I have to put a CCA number somewhere, and that's enough. And I just heard that Julia will be talking about that later. So, um, so safety profile, right? Which safety is, yeah, <laughs> I assume you uh, understand that it might be functional safety or safety in general, right? Uh, 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 in order to express all this information, you have to uh, express it in a uh, standardized way, right? And then we're talking about hardware, right? Because when you're talking about safety, uh, the safety profile is that this software is running on a specific hardware configuration, right? Think, not only think about you know software running on our PCs or Anything, think about medical devices, right, that you have in your heart or, uh, you know, train engines and stuff like that, right? So you have to be able to specify something more than that. The nice things about hardware, of course, is that the whole concept of build of materials is pretty well known in the hardware side of things or in, you know, building construction and stuff like that. We already know it. It's software that did not know. <laughs> did not, have not embraced this concept even now, right? So, uh, we're having all these profiles uh, in order to record information, and our goal is to be able to record whatever information people might need, right? So, again, there's nothing closed, this is not a closed set, right? And if you have some information that uh, you think it would be valuable in order to be included uh, in an S bomb, uh, please come talk to us and we can add it. Right? It's, the whole idea is to be able to express whatever you want to express. Right. Yeah, and having painted this wonderful picture that you can record all the information, then we started thinking okay, at some point we realized, okay, life is, uh, life is not a simple, but. Uh, People were talking about these bombs, software building materials, right? And they were talking about different things, right? And there was some, um, you know, talking past each other. So, again, we sat down and worked uh, a lot with Steve again. And we have this idea of, you know, representing the whole life cycle of a software, right? 
Um, so, I don't know where to start from the starting because it never ends. But uh, you can start from the left hand side, you know, plan, procure, develop, build. That's the things that we usually do. Develop and build on the top right, and then we test, release, and then install and configure and all that stuff. And in every step of this life cycle, right, different things happen to the software, right? And there are different artifacts. When we're talking about uh, build, for example, or develop, this is the source files, right? Uh, yeah, I have uh, uh, five source files, and they are compiled or not, and we're using some external package, that's one of the build, and then we're using some external package, and we produce a binary, right? But when you're looking at, you know, the other uh, end about the installer, right, you give an installer and it has nothing to do about the source files that you were talking. It's about uh, shipping an executable and some installer configuration that might be configured differently and all this stuff. So when we were, depending on where you are on this uh, software life cycle, you're talking about completely different things. And we were all talking about, yes, we need an s bomb and uh, software build materials. And we started discussing, okay, what do you mean? Should I talk about the developer? Should I list you the list of source files that I'm using when I develop? All the files that you are getting uh, uh, when uh, I release, right? Or on the install, when you actually deploy it on your machine, what gets installed? These are completely different artifacts, for example, right? We're all talking about the same software, but they're completely different views. So, yeah, we spend a lot of time <laughs> uh, coming up with uh, commonly agreed uh, uh, things about this stuff. And essentially, uh, CISA came up um, with a list of different types of these bots. Right? So, Depending on where you are with your cycle, right, you can say, yeah, this is my S bomb, my source S bomb, and this is, yeah, uh, based on my uh, development environment, these are the source files that I'm working on, right? Or this is the deployed, right, or the runtime. When it's actually run, maybe it uses other libraries, nothing to do with the deployed, right? The deployed is what I actually copy to your machine, but when it runs, it also uses other libraries that are somewhere in the system that I didn't install them. Right. So each one of them is a different view of the same software, but obviously it's talking about different things. And it's good that we took you know, almost two years to <laughs> find, to discuss this and uh, come up with commonly understood um, um, definitions like that. Because at some point, you, you know, we were different, you know, we were really discussing, we were talking about different things, right? Everything is at bonds, but... So, one of the goals of this PDX is to be able to, again, if you need to record this information at any of these types, on any point in your uh, life cycle, you should be able to do that, right? So, we give you the uh, framework to be able to record this information. Right, so the SPDX project uh, um, is about recording all this information in s bonds, right? And uh, uh, I said that we were producing, obviously, the license list, then we're producing the specification, how to record this information, and we also work on tools, right? And when we say tools, this is another very big uh, discussion, right? Uh, again, we sat down and tried to do a classification of different tools, but the functional classification, right? So, depending on what does the tool do, right? For example, does it produce a bomb or does it consume a bomb, right? Or maybe it produces and consumes because it transforms the bomb, right? So, this is the first major step. And obviously many of the tools do more than one thing, right? <laughs> and uh, so for each one of these, you know, if you produce, you know, uh, 
you build, you analyze, you edit, right? You can have tools, you know, <laughs> operating on SBOM data, right? Doing any of these things, or obviously a combination of all these things, right? And uh, so we we have this wonderful uh, classification of the taxonomy. This is uh, the different things that can be done by tools, right? And but this is just the function, right? As you can imagine, there are other classifications, right? You can obviously say, hey, this is an open source tool, this is not an open source tool, right? Or um, which of the different SBOM types are supported, right? Are we talking about only the build SBOM or the deployed SBOM or whatever, right? Or the analyzed SBOM? And uh, then you have to see at which level this tool uh, is implemented, right? Going from the bottom up, it might be a, a low-level library that just handles data, right? Uh, or it can be a purpose-specific application, or it can be a complete uh, uh, application doing different things, or it can be a complete integrated environment of handling and so on, right? And uh, there are also tools that are only oriented uh, and can handle specific ecosystems, right? It's only about Python code, or it's only about Go uh, applications, or you know, NPM, or whatever, right? Uh, unfortunately, in our modern software development, each one of the ecosystems has its own quirks and peculiarities, uh, so it's almost impossible to have something that might work for everything, right? I as I said, I work for a very large company and we've seen software uh, in, developed inside the company that, you know, some are developing using, I don't know, even programming languages, right? We have something, we have lots of people developing in C, in C++, we have lots of people developing in Rust, we have lots of people developing in Go, we have people developing in Node, we have people developing in Verilog, because they're doing much more hardware-oriented things. So, yeah, it's very difficult to have, you know, tools be able to handle um, all this stuff in the same level of um, Yeah, and the list keeps expanding, right? So, yeah, we have a different tool specification. The CDX project by, uh, on itself, only... What's your mind? Language here? <laughs> Uh, if, only, if not only, mainly works on low-level libraries, right? So we produce libraries that help you read and write the essential data in SPDX format. And uh, in SPDX version 3, we actually have uh, tied very much the actual specification to the implementation. So we write the specification in a specific format that can automatically generate code in a variety of programming languages that supports all this reading and writing, right? Because, uh, yeah, uh, it was too time-consuming to uh, do it manually uh, this way. So we have tools that take the specification and actually create, for example, Python classes or Java classes for uh, everything that we create. So it's much easier when we actually modify the specification and we add a new property or yeah, a new element somewhere, right, uh, that this gets automatically translated and we can produce a new version of the uh, underlying programming language uh, libraries for that. Um, all right, yeah, uh, final words on SPDX. Uh, we're open. <laughs> uh, it's an open source project. Uh, it's open for participation to everyone. Uh, please come and join us. A uh, few things how we work. Uh, as I mentioned, we have the three uh, major teams, right? One is more technical and doing the specification and the tooling uh, oriented. The other is the legal, who are doing more of the licensing stuff and all of the SPDX license list uh, stuff. And uh, uh, then the outreach team that tries to, you know, uh, evangelize SPDX uh, 
talk about it and yeah, uh, make people uh, know about that. Uh, and then we have specific groups that focus on specific areas, and usually the experts on a specific area gather in that one. Uh, and they're talking, you know, how to do, what are the things that we want to represent in AI, right? Or, you know, uh, to defects of the security part, right? Or food functional safety or uh, how, right? And, yeah, whenever the, you know, uh, somebody, a new idea comes up, we'll say, okay, yeah, feel free to uh, create a group and to start discussing uh, amongst the experts. You know, that there is a consensus, so this is what we want to be able to express in an S1, well. and uh, therefore uh, we can uh, then take it back to the technical uh, core team and uh, yeah, uh, see how it gets integrated inside the spec. All our work is happening in the open, we're using mailing lists, we have lots of meetings, especially different groups of different meetings, right? We do everything on GitHub, so, yeah, uh, issues and pull requests is our main uh, mode of operation, right? And, yeah, you can obviously see it on the website on the CDX dev or CDX.org, I think it's both right now. And uh, the GitHub, we have an example for organizing the CDX with lots of records about that. All our meetings, for example, minutes we publish on GitHub, and yeah, you can spend a lot of time uh, find information about that. And uh, yeah, that's about it. Questions on that? I see a hand. Um, so in, in, in the SPDX version 2, you, from, from, I, I haven't dived into 3 yet, but it seems like the profiles are a bit more nuanced. It sounds to me like more like extensions to the core. So I wonder, can you have more than one profile in the same as one file? Because some of the, some of the profiles look like without or without some other profiles, they would be kind of useless, uh, or at least not useful enough for what I think would be normal use. Especially the core software and licensing together, or core yeah. software and something else, or, or data and licensing, etc. <laughs> right. So SPDX version two, as you said, it's. Uh, monolithic, so you have one document that describes things. Right. SPD exception 3 is data, right? That can be serialized on a single document or it can be in multiple documents. Each of these documents specify which profiles apply to that, which kind of information apply to that. So you can collect all the information and say, yeah, this is everything I know about my software and inside this bunch of data I'm using the uh, core profile, the software profile, the licensing profile, and the security profile. And that's all. Or only part of it. The core profile has always has to be there, because that's the basic thing. Yeah. Software is mostly always used, but for example, you might want to publish SPDX data, which is just a collection of licenses, without saying where this applies. So this would be only core and licensing, for example. So you can do whatever combination you want, right? And once you have this data, obviously, on the consumer side, you can say, filter, I only care about this view or this part. Yeah. So, convoluted example. Um, theory, so you could have that you would ship a core plus licensing profile without the software profile, and the receiving, on the receiving end, they would have core and software, and their core and software could match with your core and licensing. Is that what you're telling me? No, I'm not sure. So let's say, let's say, I'm supplying software to you, or right. we, we're somehow in a related, in the development relationship, 
and I send you my licensing information on the piece of software we're talking about. But for example, I'm made for some weird reasons. I, I made this up. Um, for some weird reasons, I'm not allowed to say what software this is applying to, but I know you have the information about the software, and you can match or you can match that with your um, software as well profile to and the two would work together or not. Or I or, am not sure I understood. Okay, so we can we can discuss this. Yeah, later. yeah okay. Let's <laughs> <it's, it's, it's, laughs> yeah. um, what about coming back to tooling? How much tooling does actually understand as PS3 now? Sorry. So <laughs> okay, we come back to that. Uh, the discussion of that. Uh, about mixing much. Uh, as I said, this PDX version 3 was frozen yesterday. yesterday. No, yeah, no, it was frozen during the weekend, right? Uh, it was published yesterday, it will be announced later this week. Uh, because we have this automatic generation of code, I expect the tools to be there you know, pretty soon, but yeah. Nothing is obviously running right now, all the things that we've changed over the weekend. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. But it will be there you know, much, much sooner than any ever. Uh, we used to see you know, yeah, a delay of a few months when we published a new version with the tools to come, come up to speed with that. But, uh, yeah, now we're squeezing the time out. And we also have, of course, Specified how translations from SPDX version 2 data to SPDX version 3 data should happen automatically, and we have tools for that. And, yeah, that's this part. We have time for one more question, if anyone's ready. Yes. Everything's ready. 